Good evening, everyone. Hi. Uh, I am really honored to be here. When I got this invitation a while back and I checked out the sorts of people who spoke in this wonderful venue, I thought, just play a cool Nick. <laughs> Wait till it's too late for them to disinvite you. Uh, it really is incredible to be in a space where uh, there's this deep devotion to, to, to reason discourse. And uh, it's just an honor for me to be here. And I really appreciate all the things that the folks at, at Town Hall Seattle have done uh, to make this place possible. So yeah, let's give it a hand. So I want to start us out in this space. This is the Cambridge Union uh, in Cambridge, England. It's the, the world's oldest debating society. 150 years old in 1965, when I want us to take our minds to that moment, that February 18th, 1965, 55 years ago this week, uh, the Cambridge Union was full of people. There were indeed so many people that all those spots on the benches were filled, all the spots in the galleries, and there were so many people in the space that you couldn't actually see that hardwood floor you can see there. There were students, mostly Cambridge students, sitting on the floor, so the debaters, when they entered the hall, they had to step over the legs of students. And indeed, when they were debating, they had to watch out, because if they moved around from away from the lectern, they might step on a student behind them. Now, why were all of these people packed into that space that night? They were there primarily to see James Bolt, who was, in the, in the words of his friend Malcolm X, the poet of the Civil Rights Revolution. Baldwin was, at that time, one of the most famous writers in the world. He'd written in just about every genre, uh, about all sorts of questions related to morality and politics. And Baldwin was, in this moment, recognized as a leading literary figure associated with the freedom struggle that was changing the United States at that moment. Just across the ocean, in Selma, Alabama, we were in the middle of the Selma campaign for voting rights. The same night that Baldwin was there, there were protesters in Marion, Alabama, who were marching to fight for their rights. It was on the same night, February 18, 1965, that Baldwin was at Cambridge, that Jimmy Lee Jackson was mortally wounded by Alabama law enforcement officers. So the students are in this space at the high tide of the civil rights movement, primarily to see James Baldwin. They're also drawn by the fact that Baldwin won't be alone there that night. He'll be sharing the platform with William F. Buckley, Jr. Now, the students at Cambridge didn't know that much about Buckley. He was not yet internationally famous. But he was, rumor had it, a formidable debater and one of the leading conservatives in the United States, second only to Barry Goldwater as a face of American conservatism at that moment. So the students were drawn in, in part, by the prospect of seeing Baldwin share the stage with someone who was a confirmed critic of the black liberation struggle. So they were on hand for an intellectual prize fight, if you will. So what I want to do tonight is tell you a little bit about the story that led up to that moment at Cambridge 55 years ago this week. Uh, this book, as you can see, it's, it's a hefty tome. It can be used as a doorstop or a weapon uh, in addition to, to, to actually reading it. Uh, and, and the reason it's so long is that I originally set out to write a book that was really focused on that night at Cambridge. But I realized pretty quickly as I dug into the research that there was a much broader story to tell. Uh, Buckley and Baldwin were born only about a year apart from each other. And so what I do in the book is I weave their intellectual biographies against the backdrop of the rise of the civil rights and conservative movements, two movements that they respectively did so much to shape. And so what I want to give you tonight is a sense of that story, and then we'll get to the debate, I promise. We'll end up back in this space by the end of the talk. And I'll play a couple clips from the debate. The BBC was there to record that night. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the aftermath, and then we'll have time for, for questions and, and, uh, and conversation. So let's start with James Baldwin, born in August 1924 in Harlem. Baldwin was the oldest of nine children. And Baldwin, in his autobiographical writings, which he writes fiction and nonfiction to try to capture the experience of what it was like for him to grow up in Harlem in the 20s and 30s, there's a few key words that he associates with that time in his life. The first is claustrophobia. Baldwin says, if you want to know what it was like for me to grow up at the margins of society in Harlem, 
you have to think about waking up in a bed with as many as six of your siblings. And Baldwin says, another thing that really is, comes to mind when I think about my childhood in Harlem is the defining fact of my parents' life was that they struggled to feed their children. So Baldwin describes what it was like to be at the margins uh, of society, he describes what it was like for his parents to struggle to feed their children. And Baldwin says the thing that marked especially his father's experience was a sense of despair. Baldwin watched his father live a life in which he was in despair. He, he couldn't quite grasp how a world could exist where it would be so hard for him just to, to, make, you know, to provide the, the circumstances for the family to survive. And so Baldwin, in this context, he is looking, he says in his autobiographical writings, for a handle, a lever, something to hang on to in the context of this despair. And that handle, that lever for James Baldwin is language, it's words. From a very young age, well, as soon as Baldwin can read, he reads everything he can get his hands on. He says, I read every book in the, in the library closest to where I grew up. And then I began to venture outside of my neighborhood to libraries where I wasn't supposed to go. And I was often reminded I wasn't supposed to be in those libraries. To read as many things as I could get my, hand on, get my hands on because Baldwin says, I felt in the, those books, in books from many you know, different places far away from where I was, I, I felt a sense of connection to the characters I was reading about. I found ways to make sense of my own experience. And so at the age of eight, Baldwin begins to write and write and write, and he writes until the day he dies. And Baldwin, setting pen to paper, tries to make sense of his own experience and tries really to make sense of the human experience, the paradoxes that he sees at the heart of the human experience that I'll talk about in a little bit. So Baldwin describes this childhood in Harlem uh, in, in a lot of powerful ways, and we'll talk a little bit more about the ways in which he draws on that experience. He says experience is the primary, the best source for any writer. Right? Drawing on your own personal experience and reflecting on it, Baldwin did that about as well as, as anybody. Meanwhile, William F. Buckley Jr. is born only 15 months later and in the same city, also born in New York City in November of 1925. I say in the book he may as well have been born on a different planet. Whereas Baldwin describes that experience of claustrophobia, claustrophobia marking his childhood, Buckley describes seemingly, seemingly endless space. He spends most of his childhood at, uh, on an estate in Sharon, Connecticut called Great Elm, 47-acre estate. Big mansion, live-in servants, live-in tutors, area, you know, areas to go, ride horses, and all sorts of things. And Buckley describes a childhood that was really remarkable by just about any standard. Uh, he and his nine siblings were homeschooled. They had live-in tutors and visiting tutors who taught them every subject under the sun. Uh, one of Buckley's sisters describes the list of things. She says that the goal of our education in the Buckley household was nothing short of perfection. And she says, we learned everything from apologetics to art to ballroom dancing to banjo, ballroom dance, uh, 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 excuse me, uh, building boats and bottles. She goes on like that in alphabetical order. All the way down to tap dancing, tennis, typing, and wood carving. <laughs> now, what is most important about the Buckley education is they were taught a particular worldview. Part of that worldview was uh, a particular brand, particularly conservative, authoritarian brand of Catholicism, but politically they were taught a doctrine that the family called individualism, which was a kind of catch-all term for the Buckleys that was meant to capture a hostility to any form of collectivism, communism, socialism, the New Deal policies of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the Buckley children were taught to also to be suspicious of democracy. The Buckley's, the Buck Buckley's parents taught them that there are some people who are fit to rule, and there are others who are fit to be ruled. Guess what, Buckley children, you're fit to rule. And that hierarchy, that belief in hierarchy was thoroughly racialized in the Buckley household. So Buckley and his siblings, they, could, they say that by any definition, our parents were racist. They believed in a natural racial hierarchy. But, this is an important, uh, important uh, point for the Buckleys, but our parents taught us that we should not treat others who are different from us with animus. We should feel an obligation to take care of them, especially those who are loyal to us. You can see where this is going. <laughs> 
And so Buckley, Buckley is caught that from a very young age, and that sticks with him. Uh, and he takes as his goal, and in many ways I say in the book that Baldwin kind of sets as his goal to avoid becoming his father, right? He doesn't want to become consumed by despair. Baldwin's father dies in 1943 in a mental institution. And as far as, as far as James Baldwin is concerned, his father dies of despair. So Baldwin sets out as his goal to avoid becoming his father. Buckley doesn't quite want to become his father, who's this real estate and oil magnate. Uh, who, who, you know, who make, makes you know, lots of money to provide this, this lifestyle I just described. But Buckley sets out as his mission in life to defend his father's worldview. Because his father taught him that that worldview, that understanding of the world, is what made the family's affluence possible. Now Buckley takes this worldview with him to first a prep school in Connecticut called Millbrook, and then he serves for two years in the U.S. Army. Uh, and then he enrolls at Yale as a 21-year-old freshman. Uh, and he says he arrives at Yale expecting to find professors at the podium who will reinforce his Christian and individualist values he's been taught by his parents. Now, he was disappointed to find. He found some of them. But he also found a lot of professors at the lectern who were either indifferent about these values or even hostile to them. And so Buckley says that Yale and institutions like it are marked by this terrible paradox. <coughs> Christian individualist parents send their children off to be educated only to have them converted into atheistic socialists. <laughs> <laughs> and so Buckley, while he's at Yale, finds ways to resist, right? He's never shy from a very young age. Buckley, this is one thing that Baldwin and Buckley have in common is that they are both <coughs> devoted to the use of language to change the world. And Buckley, from a very young age, uses his voice, uses his pen to advance his worldview. And so he joins the debating society. He becomes a very skilled debater. He'd done that in prep school. He'd really done it around the, the dinner table at home before that. Uh, and he also becomes what they call chairman or editor-in-chief of the Yale Daily News. And he uses that perch to comment on national politics, international politics, and campus politics. So he does things like write editorials about the depravity of his professors, you know, with these people who are teaching views that he finds to be problematic. He goes on, soon after graduating from Yale, the first thing he does is write a book-length indictment of his alma mater, God and Man of Yale. And in that book, Buckley says that Yale and, inst and many institutions in, in higher education, most institutions in higher education, um, are they operate under the illusion that this idea of academic freedom is a good thing. Buckley says what, what needs to happen is alumni and boards of trustees need to start exerting more power over who is hired, who is fired, and what is being taught. So Buckley says academic freedom is a hoax. That's the term he uses. It's a hoax and it needs to be overthrown. If that's not controversial enough, Buckley's next book was a book length defense of Joseph McCarthy. So Buckley writes, co-authors a book called McCarthy and His Enemies, and in that book he says, look, McCarthy is a flawed instrument. He's not perfect in his quest to root out communists wherever he can find them. But he's doing something that is very defensible and very worthwhile. He is trying to enforce a public orthodoxy. A public orthodoxy that says there are some things that can be thought and said in our society, and there are others that simply cannot. Buckley was taught by one of his professors at Yale, a guy named Wilmore Kendall, that the idea of an open society is a very dangerous idea. Any sane society is a closed society, where we enforce certain things. So you can see the connection between what he was up to in God and Man at Yale, the kind of education he thought should be enforced. He, but it's really important to note, Buckley was not against professors indoctrinating students. They were just had to be indoctrinating, indoctrinating with the right things. <laughs> So in this same period, right, Baldwin is arriving on the intellectual scene. So the late 1940s, early 1950s is when Buckley is, is causing a stir with both on campus and then with these first two books. Uh, Baldwin is, in 1948, he decides in order to survive, he needs to leave the United States. So he leaves the United States for Paris in 1948. And he really wants, what he wants to do is write an autobiographical novel about his experience in Harlem. And he, he realizes that he can't really do that unless he leaves. He needs a little bit of critical distance in order to reflect on his experiences uh, in the United States, his experiences growing up. 
And so Baldwin writes that novel. He gets it published eventually. Uh, Go Tell on the Mountain is what it's called, and I recommend everybody read it. And it, he, in that novel, he reflects on what it was like from the inside to live the sort of life that he led in Harlem, to live the sort of life that his mother and father led in Harlem. He wanted to try to capture the depth of their experience, not just the, the sort of oppression and domination they experienced, but also the ways in which they found ways to survive that, that experience. Baldwin really thought that was important to really capture the depth of, of human lives. That's what he set out to do in that novel. And he's also writing a lot of book reviews in this period, trying to use the work of other writers to figure out what it means to be an honest man and a good writer. Baldwin has his second novel, uh, Giovanni's Room, he completes it in 1955, and he goes back to the same publisher who published Go Tell on the Mountain, uh, Alfred Knopf, and he says, I have another novel for you. And Knopf looks at it and says, Jimmy, I'm not going to publish this. And I'm going to do that as a favor to you. You're going to ruin your career. You, he says, in effect, this is Baldwin's uh, recounting of it, Jimmy, you are a promising young Negro writer. Why are you handing me an all-white gay novel? <laughs> so Giovanni's Room, for those who haven't read it, is about a young American named uh, David who travels to Paris and falls in love with an Italian bartender named Giovanni. And the, the, the novel tells the story of their affair from its enchanted beginnings to its bitter end. And Baldwin says to Knopf, if you think that my primary subject, subject in Go Tell on the Mountain is race, and my primary subject in Giovanni's Room is sex, you're missing the point, sir. My primary subject is now, and will forever be, the freedom and fulfillment of human beings. And what is preventing the freedom and fulfillment of human beings? So the, the sort of ostensible story is, is really meant to get at something deeper, always, for Baldwin. So Baldwin writes those novels. He's also writing essays. He becomes one of the great essayists ever, as far as I'm concerned. Baldwin writes essays on a variety of subjects. And in these essays, there's really a, a, sort of, a series of central themes that I think tie Baldwin's work together, both his fiction and his nonfiction. Baldwin is really obsessed with the nexus of three things, identity, morality, and power. The question of identity is always on Baldwin's mind. Who is it that we take ourselves to be as individuals and as members of communities? And how does our conception of who we take ourselves to be lead us to treat other people? And those two things are, of course, interconnected. They go back and forth. And who has the power? Who doesn't? And why? And if those power relationships are unjustified, what can we do about it? Those are the questions that are central to Baldwin's, both his fictional and his non-fictional writing. And Baldwin, as he reflects on those question, questions, he diagnoses us in the following way. He says most human beings, most of the time, are in a state of identity crisis. We don't really want to know who we are. So we delude ourselves with mythologies and ideologies that will make us feel safe. And Baldwin says what we tend to do is we rely on the idea of status. We think about who we are in relation to others. And we really, what we, in order to feel safe, we want to try to feel superior to others. Right? So Baldwin says at the root of our trouble is fear. We want to feel safe, and we, we sort of have these moments where we feel a little bit safe when we feel a little bit superior to somebody else. But Baldwin says it's not a solution, because we are in a state of social paranoia, he calls it. We're all, we always know that even in those moments when we feel a little bit more powerful than someone else, we're haunted by the fact that someone somewhere is feeling a sense of superiority to us. And so Baldwin says, this is the root of our trouble. If you want to understand racism, if you want to understand homophobia, so Baldwin, uh, you know, he is somebody who is, uh, his sexual identity is, is, is something that's central to his writing, and we can talk more about that, and I'll mention it uh, a little bit toward the end of my talk. He says, if you want to understand any of these things, you need to recognize that the, the, the sort of status anxiety that we feel, this fear that we feel, this desire, this, this fundamental desire to feel safe is at the root of, of all of our trouble. That's the diagnosis. I'll save the prescription for the end. <laughs> now, in 1955, Buckley, 54, 55, he's looking for his professional niche. He's trying to find a way to have an impact on day-to-day -day politics. 
His first two books had done quite well. They were panned by reviewers, which actually made him quite happy. Uh, but he was frustrated by the glacial pace of book publishing. Right? I can, I can relate. It takes a while to get books published. And he wanted to have an impact on day-to-day -day politics. And he tried working for uh, a conservative magazine that existed at the time, the American Mercury. Buckley was not cut out to be anyone's employee. Uh, remember, there's some people fit to rule, and he was one of them. Uh, so that lasts about four months. And what he really wants is a magazine of his own. And most of us, if we want a magazine of our own, can't have one. But it's, it helps to have those really wealthy parents. Um, and so Buckley gets an advance on his inheritance, and he proves to be a skilled fundraiser. And he begins in 54 to put together what becomes National Review magazine. And Buckley, at this time, what he really wants to do, he, he recognizes that in the first half of the 20th century, magazines played an extraordinarily important role in American political culture, American political development. Magazines like The Nation and The New Republic did so much to shape not only ideology, but public policy in the progressive movement. And so Buckley says, you know, he wants to found a magazine that can help form a conservative movement. Because really, at the time, there wasn't something that we could call a conservative movement. There were disparate groups on the right who didn't get along very well. There were libertarians who were especially worried about what they saw as excessive state intervention in economic affairs. There were traditionalists who were especially concerned about what they saw the perceived decline of religion and morality in the West. And they didn't like each other very much. And Buckley said, but can't we get together under the banner of what we don't like? We don't like liberals, and we don't like communists. And he was able to convince some of these people who really didn't get along to join him in this project, in this National Review project. Now, one of the big questions, as Buckley's found in this magazine, is where will the magazine come down on questions of race and civil rights? Now, remember, right in the time when Buckley is founding this magazine, the latest phase in the struggle for, for equal rights is, is really heating up. 1954, you have the Brown v. Board school desegregation decision. The white backlash against that decision, the rise of white citizens councils in the, in the South, which I'll talk about in a minute, the, the, the backlash by elites against uh, desegregation, the, the Southern Manifesto, all these things that are happening in the country. You have the lynching of Emmett Till, which gets headlines around the world. You have the arrest of Rosa Parks, the rise of Martin Luther King Jr., the Montgomery bus boycott. All that is happening in the same moment when Buckley is found in National Review. Now, it's important to note that it's not a foregone conclusion that someone founding a conservative magazine in 1954, 1955, that that magazine will be hostile to civil rights. There is, it's important to remember that the, the primary partisan uh, faction resisting civil rights what was, of course, Southern Democrats. Buckley considered himself to be a conservative Republican. There were cons people who identified themselves as conservative Republicans who were supportive of civil rights, including Senator William Noland, who Buckley had contribute the lead article to the first issue of National Review. Buckley liked Nolan so much, he wanted him to primary President Eisenhower in 1956 from his right. Uh, and Nolan thought of himself as quite friendly to civil rights. But Buckley chose another course. And I argue in the book the course that he chose has had consequences for us down to this day. Buckley, this founding father of American conservatism, chooses a course of resistance. Buckley says 10 years after the founding of National Review, they're, they're, somebody's putting together a 10-year anniversary uh, book about National Review. And they ask him, what, was, what has been your goal on questions of race and civil rights? And Buckley says, my goal was for the magazine to be extremely articulate, always important to Buckley, non-racist, but not reflexively racially egalitarian. Non-racist, but not necessarily racially egalitarian. This is a fine line. Now, to work our way from the conclusion back to the reasoning, the conclusion ends up being that National Review resists just about just about every phase in the black freedom struggle. They make it very clear from the first issue they're strongly against Brown v. Board, the school desegregation decision. They're against it, they're against any federal intervention to interfere with segregation. They are critics of Martin Luther King. The one thing that King does that they say is okay is leading economic boycotts. Economic boycotts are okay with National Review, that's about it. They're critics of King at every other turn. They're critics of the student sit-in protesters, because after all, they're violating the right to private property. 
They're critics of the Freedom Riders. They are against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. You name it, they're against it. Now, Buckley has a lot of reasons why he wants the magazine to have a sophisticated, conservative case against civil rights. And he relies on all sorts of writers to make this case. And I have a few of them pictured here. They celebrate people like Strom Thurmond, who was a family friend of the Buckleys. It was uh, one of the Buckley Sr.'s favorite politician. They had a state in South Carolina as well, so Thurman would come over for dinner sometimes. Uh, and, they, and the National Review calls him a latter-day Patrick Henry, leading a second American revolution. They also, uh, Buckley had people like Richard Weaver, who's pictured on the bottom right there, who was a very distinguished uh, intellectual, who would write think pieces for National Review defending what he called the Southern way of life. And essentially what Buckley got from Weaver was a philosophical defense of everything his parents ever taught him. Racial hierarchy is okay because there's such a thing as fruitful inequality. Buckley relied on this guy on the upper left, James Jackson Kilpatrick, who was known as the leading salesman for segregation, a journalist who had devoted his professional life to doing everything he could to resist desegregation. He was Buckley's go-to guy on race, and I'll come back to Kilpatrick in a minute. Buckley even cozied up to folks like William J. Simmons in the upper right. William J. Simmons was the leader of the White Citizens Council meeting, which was known by civil rights activists and journalists as the Uptown or Rotary Club version of the Ku Klux Klan. Same values of the Klan, different outfits. They, they used uh, different tactics in the Klan. They relied on, uh, they could ruin your life, right? If they thought you were too friendly to civil rights, they would ruin your life using economic means and other means. Uh, and so Buckley even cozies up behind the scenes to people like Simmons. But Buckley's own views come through loud and clear in a, an essay he writes in 1957 called Why the South Must Prevail. It's really called Why the White South Must Prevail. That's the white is un, unstated. And in that essay, the proximate cause for that essay was the Civil Rights Act of 1957. This is a piece of legislation we don't talk much about because it ended up being hollowed out of just about any meaning. And the way, one of the ways it was hollowed out of just about any meaning is senators like Senator Thurman had a clause included in this law, which was at least ostensibly supposed to help guarantee the right to vote. Thurman had a clause included that said any accusation against Southern officials will be decided by juries and not by federal judges. Now, of course, that is essentially a jury nullification clause. No jury in the South is going to convict any Southern official of violating anyone's civil rights. So Buckley writes why the South must prevail to defend that clause. Buckley says, he has a lot of reasons he gives. The central reason is this, and I have it on my first slide, so I'll just quote Buckley directly. Uh, the white community in the South is entitled to take such measures as are necessary to prevail politically and culturally because for the time being, it is the advanced race. Buckley says that white people in the South have an obligation, not only the right, but the duty to preserve civilization. And this is, a, this is the means by which they are going to do it. And he's perfectly okay with that. Indeed, he's celebrating it. Now, in the next issue of National Review, Buckley's brother-in-law, L. Brent Bozell, who was an associate editor, also by then Buckley's brother, uh, you know, his, his brother-in-law had married Buckley's sister, and he was Buckley's Yale debate partner, and he co-authored that McCarthy book with him. Bozell writes a page-length critique of, it, of, of Buckley's position and why the South must prevail. Now, it's important to note, uh, Bozell was no friend of civil rights. He was deeply opposed to the, the Brown uh, school desegregation decision. He was supportive of massive resistance to civil rights in the South. But he was also a lawyer. And he said, the problem I have with your position, Bill, is that there's a law, there's a law at stake, the 15th Amendment, which guarantees the right to vote. And shouldn't we as conservatives care about the rule of law, the majesty of the law? Isn't that part of our creed? Buckley, in the same issue, writes a response to his brother-in-law. And he says a couple of things that are especially noteworthy. One, he says, well, Brent, we're talking about the 15th Amendment. Is that really as legitimate as the rest of the Constitution? 
And Buckley was always one for $10 vocabulary words. He says, isn't that viewed by most of the South as an inorganic accretion <laughs> on the original document? Grafted onto the original document by victors at war, Buckley says. Now I say in the book, one has to wonder where that leaves the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. Now, uh, Buckley then also says, but if we must follow the Constitution, then perhaps what we ought to prescribe is a colorblind program of disenfranchisement. This might be sounding familiar. Buckley says that the South can save itself from accusations of racism if they just apply the law neutrally and start disenfranchising more white people. So the answer is not more democracy, it's less democracy. And Buckley carries that view with him all the way to the, the debate with Baldwin when he makes the same argument. So that idea of colorblind constitutionalism ends up being crucial in the campaign to hollow out the achievements of the civil rights movement. Now, right in the moment when Buckley and his crew are figuring out how to rationalize their resistance to black liberation, Baldwin is making his first trip to the American South. So this is a moment for me as a writer where I do this really deep dive into this, this philosophy of resistance of Buckley and the National Review crew to you know, a transition to Baldwin traveling to the South for the first time. And it was just one of those moments for me that was, uh, you know, it really brought through the power of, of this, this story of putting these two guys together. So when Buckley and his crew are in New York sorting out how to resist civil rights, Baldwin is sitting in the living room of a 15-year-old boy who's the first black student in a previously all-white school. Baldwin is looking into this young man's eyes, and what Baldwin wants to know is what it is like to see the world through those eyes. He says, this boy's eyes not only spoke, but registered volumes. He said, what had those eyes seen? They had seen on that first day when he's trying to attend his new school, White students, arm in arm, forming a human barricade to keep him out. He had seen and experienced verbal and physical assaults at the hands of other students. He had seen his parents' jobs threatened by their decision to send him to that school. And so Baldwin is trying to get a sense from this young man how he manages to face what Baldwin calls what is surely the most difficult moment in his day. The morning, when he wakes up, and realizes that it all has to be gone through again. So Baldwin is always trying to get us to think about the world through the eyes of others. And he, he notices as he's talking to this young man that he's, he's rather reserved about describing what he's experiencing. And, and Baldwin realizes pretty quickly that's because his mother's in the room. And his mother was one of only a few dozen African-American parents in a city that had over 50,000 African-American people who even dared apply for this program. So in some sense, she was someone who had the audacity, the courage, to send him marching toward that white barricade. And Baldwin was always had this sense of, of connection to parents. He, he says as the oldest sibling, he often felt to be in the parental role. He was always haunted by what the world must look like through the eyes of a parent at the margins of society. What it must feel like to send your child out into the world knowing that that world is going to treat them as if their life doesn't matter. How, Baldwin asked in 1943, sitting in a Harlem church, the funeral of his father, he looks around at all these parents and he says, how can they equip their children to deal with this world? Baldwin says it's, it seems like an impossibility. That's the term he uses in that, that, that essay. So Baldwin talks to this mother and tries to get a sense from her of how she had the courage, the audacity, to send her son to this school and subject herself and her family to, to all the threats and, and all the repercussions of that. Baldwin then goes from talking to this family to, the, to meet with the white principal of the school. And Baldwin you know, says, earlier in my life, I would have walked in that room ready for a fist fight. But as, as a more mature intellectual and writer, he wants to go, he goes into that principal's office trying to understand this man. He wants to, again, try to see the world through his eyes. And perhaps to his surprise, he finds the man is, seems gentle and even honorable, but also delusional. This man had been taught, and he didn't seem to have, uh, you know, Baldwin says he didn't seem to have animus 
toward uh, folks like this young man who's, who's this new student in the school. He seems to just sort of do what he's doing as a kind of reflex action. It's, it's consistent with everything he's ever been taught. And so Baldwin is not interested in getting this guy's views of Brown v. Board or his views of the school integration program in North Carolina. He's interested in what the world looks like through his eyes. What is it like, he says, for you to play this role? He says, I think it must be very hard. You're playing a role that requires you to treat this young man with a kind of inhumanity for something for which he has no responsibility. And Baldwin says he has no more responsibility for it than you do, sir. And Baldwin says in that moment he looks into his principal's eyes and he sees that he's bewildered and he's terrified. And he uses that same term he used to describe those Harlem parents, impossibility. He sees in this, this man's eyes that even if he can reach the point where he's no longer deluded into the idea that some people have greater value as a result of the color of their skin, even if he gets to that point, what's he going to do, given the role he occupies in society? That's the kind of thing Baldwin is doing in his writing, is grappling with those sorts of questions. Now, uh, just keep him, take, a, take a look at the time here. Okay, good. Um, so, in the book, 1962, 1963, 1964, so much happens every day. And Baldwin and Buckley are so prolific as writers. Not only their published writings, but they're writing letters. You know, so I visited the archive, the Buckley Archive at Yale several times, the Baldwin Archive in, in Harlem. And you, know, you really get a glimpse from their published writings and from their letters. Uh, you, you get a sense of what they're thinking almost every day as they're living through and helping shape this history. And so there's, as, as the book goes on, the sort of amount of time that I'm covering gets shorter and shorter because so much is happening because Baldwin and Buckley really are, as I say here, in the eye of the storm. So I thought I'd just give you one example from each side uh, and then we'll, we'll watch a couple of clips from the debate and wrap up and have some, some time for conversation. So Baldwin in 1962, is invited onto a television program called The Open Mind, a show that's actually still on. And Baldwin is invited onto this show to sit across the table from James Jackson Kilpatrick, the country's leading salesman for segregation. Kilpatrick had just published a book in defense of Southern school segregation. And The Open Mind had the inspired idea of inviting Kilpatrick to discuss that book with none other than James Baldwin. Now the context in which they have this conversation is really important. Just weeks before Baldwin sits across the table from the country's leading salesman for segregation, we had the Battle of Ole Miss. James Meredith, an African American Air Force veteran, <coughs> tried to enroll in classes at the University of Mississippi and all hell broke loose. You had what federal officials called an armed insurrection on that campus. People were killed, many people were injured, many were arrested. And Baldwin sits down across the table from Kilpatrick to talk about segregation. Baldwin and Kilpatrick are welcome to the show. And the first thing Baldwin says is this. He looks Kilpatrick in the eyes and he says, you think there's a difference between men like you who dress in fancy suits and write semi-sophisticated books and the people in those streets who are committing racist acts of violence. There is no difference. In fact, Mr. Kilpatrick, I hold you far more responsible than I hold them. Many of those people acting in those streets, they are caught in a web of delusion that they don't really understand. You, sir, are weaving that web of delusion, that delusion of white supremacy, not because you care about them, but because you care about your own power. Baldwin says, I accuse you not of betraying me. I accuse you of betraying them. That's how Baldwin starts the show. <laughs> now, he goes on for the next hour interrogating Kilpatrick about his white supremacist views and trying to get him to explain why he's taking the positions he's taking and, and to defend them. And the, the sum of Kilpatrick's case is, I am a segregationist and a white supremacist because I care about Western civilization. 
And white people, this might sound a lot, sounds a lot like Buckley, white people are the ones best positioned to preserve whatever is good in Western civilization. Now you can imagine James Baldwin has some questions about this. <laughs> but what he says, that really the sum of Baldwin's argument uh, is he accuses Kilpatrick of a second betrayal. He says, you, sir, are not defending Western civilization. You are betraying Western civilization. You claim to care about the Judeo-Christian tradition, what is best in that tradition. But you are everything you are doing is undermining what is best in that tradition. You claim to care about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. You are undermining those things. The people who are doing the most to conserve the best in the Western tradition, Baldwin says, are those young people in the streets who are putting their lives on the line for freedom. That's the second betrayal that he accused. Yeah, so Kilpatrick, and he says, sir, you are not a true conservative. The only thing you're trying to conserve is your own power. So Baldwin has this, these, these sorts of encounters, uh, and that one is especially powerful. On the Buckley side of, of things, uh, there's a lot to say about what he does in this period. He goes through, it's really, I mean, one of the things about doing the kind of in-depth, slow motion, you know, dive into, into Buckley's mind is you get to see how he's adapting, right? He sees he's losing a lot of battles in this period, right? He's, he's losing battles like he predicts that the, uh, that the March on Washington um, is going to be a, a disaster, you know, it's going to be riots and violence and so on. He's wrong about that. Um, he, he, he loses uh, the battle over the Civil Rights Act in 1964. His, his favorite politician, Barry Goldwater, gets absolutely obliterated in the 1964 election. Buckley is losing all these battles, but he's trying to figure out how to adapt so he can win the war. And really, the most remark one of the most remarkable moments uh, for, for me in looking at this is right before the 1964 election, Goldwater versus Johnson. And Goldwater, of course, had voted against the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Uh, Buckley writes, a, or he has a, a, a sort of section of National Review Commission in September 1964 on race in the campaign. Now, race had been a central issue in the campaign. Uh, the largest civil rights demonstration after the March on Washington was a demonstration against the Goldwater nomination at the 1964 <coughs> Republican Convention in San Francisco. Martin Luther King said he saw dangerous signs of Hitlerism in the Goldwater campaign. Jackie Robinson, who's at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, the great, the baseball great, he says he smells the stench of fascism in the arena. So race is central to the campaign, but in this special section of National Review, Buckley has commissioned in September 1964, has almost no mention of the Civil Rights Act, really almost no mention of Goldwater, who Buckley knew at that point he was going to lose. It has almost no mention of the South. The South had been won. The Deep South had been won. It went from being solidly democratic, Buckley knew, to being Goldwater country. And so what does Buckley devote that issue to? An essay on the white backlash. It's called The White Backlash. Essentially saying that white people are feeling threatened by black liberation, and they should be. They are feeling left out. They are feeling like uh, you know, one of the parties has become simply interested in minority rights. So Buckley has an essay written that basically defends that feeling of white backlash. Buckley, although he was critical of George Wallace, who he thought was the problem, with, the major problem with George Wallace, Buckley says, is that he's not a smart enough politician to defeat people like Martin Luther King. And that is the point. We have to defeat Martin Luther King, Buckley says. But Wallace, but Buckley actually celebrates Wallace in this period. Wallace, as you may recall, had these sort of this symbolic, these three symbolic primary runs against Lyndon Johnson on the Democratic side in 1964. In Wisconsin, Indiana, and Maryland. And Wallace gets over 30% of the vote in all three of those primaries. And Buckley celebrates this. He says, Wallace is onto something. He's tapping into a political energy that conservatives need to, need to grasp and need to harness. And so Buckley has this piece on the white backlash published, and then the two follow-up pieces, the first is about busing to achieve racial balance, greater racial balance in schools in New York, and all the reasons why that ought to be resisted. The second is about fair housing law in California. 
There had been a fair housing law passed in 1963 that was quite progressive for the time. And the same electorate that overwhelmingly voted for Johnson in the 64 election, an even greater percentage voted to repeal that fair housing law. So the politics of race is undergoing an evolution here, and Buckley is right there at the center of it. This sort of old segregationist thing has to adapt. Power always adapts. It has to adapt to a new politics of racial resentment that's slightly more subtle and essentially really capitalizes on this not in my backyard sort of thing. All right, so we lead, that leads us up to this moment in uh, February of 1965. The, the, the story of how the debate came to happen was the first story I wanted to try to solve, figure out, uh, and that was one of the really nice things for me as somebody who spent most of my time writing about the 19th century. Uh, I couldn't interview anybody from the 19th century. I tried. I hear Frederick Douglass is still doing amazing things, but, uh, but he would never respond to my calls. And uh, so the, the students who hosted the, the debate, the Cambridge debate in 1965, there were about 20 then. The, the folks who were still with us are in their 70s, so I was able to interview a number of these, uh, these, these folks who hosted the debate. Um, and so I can tell you more about how the debate came to happen in the Q&A if you'd like. But the motion before the House was, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. That was the motion they were debating. You can guess who was on which side. <laughs> and uh, there's two student debaters that, that speak first, one on each side, and then Baldwin gets up to speak. So, if you'll bear with me for a moment, uh, I will queue up just a little sample of, of Baldwin speaking and then a sample of Buckley speaking. To discover the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians when you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians were you. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace, and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. <coughs> the disaffection, the demoralization, and the gap between one person and another, only on the basis of the color of their skins, begins there and accelerates, accelerates throughout a whole lifetime. So that presently you realize you're 30 and are having a terrible time managing to trust your countrymen. By the time you are 30, you have been through a certain kind of mill. And the most serious effect of the mill you've been through is again not the catalog of disaster. The policemen, the taxi drivers, the waiters, the landlady, the landlord, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours of every day, which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. It is not that. It is by that time you've begun to see it happening in your daughter or your son or your niece or your nephew. You are 30 by now and nothing you have done has helped you to escape the trap. But what is worse than that is that nothing you have done and as far as you can tell, nothing you can do will save your son or your daughter for meeting the same disaster and not impossibly coming to the same end. So Baldwin at Cambridge delivers a speech unlike any speech those folks had ever heard before. Uh, you know, formal debate in these sorts of debating societies is a kind of combination of intellectual exercise and performance art. You, know, you get a lot of sort of jocularity, humor thrown into the speeches. Baldwin shows up and says, the first thing he says is, I am here tonight as a kind of Jeremiah. One thing I didn't mention earlier is that Baldwin spent his teenage years from 14 to 17 as a young minister in Harlem storefront churches. He left the church at 17, but he, ends, he, he was forever a preacher. And so he says, I'm here to deliver a Jeremiah. I'm here to deliver a sermon about white supremacy. And what he does, as you can see in this part of the speech, is he talks about the way, the impact that white supremacy has on what he calls the subjugated. And really, remember, the theme of the, of the debate is the American dream. And so by talking about not just what white supremacy does to those who are its victims in the moment, but the ways in which white supremacy 
you can, you can see it as a parent. It's going to happen to the next generation. So that idea in the American dream that you can feel hopeful about what's going to happen for the next generation, Baldwin says, parents are haunted by, the, by the, the idea that maybe that's not true. And Baldwin, then he goes on to talk about the impact of white supremacy on the subjugators, those who are the would-be beneficiaries of this doctrine. And Baldwin says it's very important, and this is something that runs through his writing, it's very important to remember that the would-be beneficiaries of white supremacy are also its victims. Baldwin gives the most powerful example imaginable in this historical moment. He talks about Sheriff Jim Clark in Selma, Alabama, who's being, who's being seen on newspaper, you know, new, newspapers around the world, on television, brandishing his cattle prod in the streets of Alabama, using it against men, women, and children fighting for their rights. Baldwin says, it's easy to dismiss Jim Clark as a monster, but he's not a monster, he's a human being. And when he uses his cattle prod against one of his victims, What's happening to his victim is ghastly, but in some ways what's happening to Clark is much, much worse. Jim Clark's moral life, that's the term Baldwin uses, his moral life has been destroyed by the plague called color. Jim Clark's sense of his worth in the world is attached to the delusion of whiteness. That's where he gets his sense of value in the world. That's, the, where he, that's how he understands his role in the world. And Baldwin says, what could be more pathetic than that? Clark is among those who are betrayed by this doctrine. So Baldwin delivers this speech, and he gets a standing ovation, which is a very rare thing in the Virginia. So now Buckley has his shot. Buckley says later that I knew it wasn't going to be my night. <laughs> um, and he, he said, I had a choice. Do I, do I try to you know, placate the audience a little bit, or do I go for the jugular? And, and you'll see uh, what he does. The American community, almost everywhere he goes, uh, treats him with the kind of unction, uh, the kind of satisfaction uh, at posturing carefully for his flagellations of our civilization that indeed, uh, quite properly, uh, commands the contempt which he so eloquently showers upon us. Uh, it is impossible, in my judgment, uh, to deal with the indictment of Mr. Baldwin unless one is prepared to deal with him as a white man. Unless one is prepared to say to him, the fact that your skin is black is utterly irrelevant to the arguments that you raise. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, you sit here as is your rhetorical device uh, and lay the entire weight of the Negro ordeal on your own shoulders uh, is irrelevant to the argument that we are here to discuss. The gravamen of Mr. Baldwin's charges Ameri of, against America are not so much that our civilization has failed him uh, and his people, that our ideals are insufficient, but that we have no ideals, that our ideals rather are some sort of a superficial coating uh, which we come up with at any given moment in order to justify uh, whatever commercial and noxious experiment we are engaged in. Uh, thus, uh, Mr. Baldwin can write his book, The Fire Next Time, uh, in which he threatens America. Uh, he didn't, in writing that book, speak with the British accents that he used exclusively tonight in which he threatened America with the necessity uh, for us to uh, jettison... Uh, for us to jettison our entire civilization. The only thing that the white man has that the Negro should want, he said, is power. All right, so you get a sense of, of Buckley's approach. Uh, most of the speech is, is, is in that spirit. Uh, he, he attacks Baldwin. He says Baldwin is hell-bent on overthrowing Western civilization. Uh, Buckley is really offended by this one line in the fire next time when Baldwin does say something like, the only thing that the white man has the black man should want is power. Uh, Buckley wants that sentence to end um, with civilization, right? Knowing what we know from his, his earlier thought. Uh, so, so Buckley goes on like this for, for quite a while. He later on is confronted by uh, a, a, what it turns out to be a young uh, American sociology professor at Cambridge 
who uh, at the Cambridge Union, like in the House of Commons, you could stand up and the speaker could acknowledge you for a question. And, and uh, Buckley's kind of doing this, what would you have us do routine? And uh, this, this, this guy says, this guy named Earl Hopper, who I was able to interview for the book, says, you can start by allowing uh, black people to vote in Mississippi. And, um, and Buckley then goes on to, to explain, uh, the problem, sir, in Mississippi is not that black people aren't voting, it's that too many white people are voting. And what I would do immediately in Mississippi is I would disenfranchise 60% of the white people who are currently voting, uh, and that would be our solution. I say, you know, Buckley says that would move us toward a more reasonable civil rights on a more reasonable timeline. I say, you know, the civil rights, one of the slogans of the civil rights movement was freedom now. Uh, Buckley's slogan for the civil rights movement was some freedom one day <laughs> when we decide you're ready. Uh, and so Buckley goes on, the most substantive part of his speech, I think, is when he says toward the end that the, the race problem in America is the result of an un, what he calls an unfortunate conjunction. And there's the one side of that conjunction is there are individual white people, he uses that term, individual white people out there, who are racist. And we have to try to convince them to not be racist. Now notice the use of individual, right, is, is, is not a systemic problem. It has to do with a few bad apples. And also notice that by saying those individuals are out there, Buckley is, of course, excluding everything he's been doing from the category of racism, which is something we might want to think about. On the other side, the other side of the conjunction is what he calls failures of the Negro community. Community, individual. I think it's quite deliberate. Failures of the Negro community to take advantage of the opportunities that already exist. Yes, we should make more opportunities available, Buckley says. But in the meantime, I call on James Baldwin to stop complaining and start encouraging his people, what Buckley says, his people, to take advantage of the opportunities that exist. Now, Baldwin wins. I often I sometimes I forget to say who wins. Baldwin's side wins 544 to 164. And uh, let me skip that. So the the aftermath of the debate, and I know I'm already over time, I told, I told Haley, I'm, I'm verbalicious, I can't help myself. Um, I want to make sure you get your money's worth, you know? Uh, so the aftermath of the debate is, is, is also very important. So they, they have this um, encounter in February 1965, and then uh, the rest of 1965 turns out to be quite, quite eventful. Just two weeks after the debate, uh, we have Bloody Sunday, right, the Selma campaign. Um, and we, uh, we have... Buckley, you know, writing, Buckley's of course writing about all these things as they're happening. Buckley gives a very unfortunate speech about Bloody Sunday in which he, he argues that the police officers in Selma exercised tremendous restraint. Um, we can talk more about that later if you'd like. Uh, and by the way, he, he says that in front of a room of, of about 6,000 NYPD officers. Um, Baldwin is there at the, at the, uh, at the Selma to Montgomery march that happens after Bloody Sunday. And Buckley and Baldwin meet one more time on the show of David Susskind, the open end show. Uh, so David Susskind was in those days one of the kings of television. He had the show called Open End. They called it Open End because it was the last thing on at night so it could just go on and on forever as long as they could keep talking. In 1967, they capped it at two hours. And Buckley and Baldwin sat down for two hours to talk about civil rights, to talk about all sorts of, of issues. And by almost everybody's account, it was Buckley's night. Buckley, Baldwin's agent did not want him to meet Buckley. He tried to cancel the Cambridge debate a week before it happened. He certainly didn't want him to go on open end with Buckley. Uh, Baldwin's agent, Robert Lance, said that the, the problem is Buckley is a master of getting under your skin. So in order to deal with him, you have to be cool. And Jimmy is never cool about the world's problems. He is always aroused is what Robert Lance said. And so he, Buckley succeeded in getting under Baldwin's skin that night in one particular way. He said to Baldwin, Baldwin's talking about the conditions under which many people live in Harlem, and Baldwin says, well, that's because the people who live in Harlem don't own Harlem. And they are marginalized by so many structures of power, sometimes you know, sort of uh, expressions of power that have a human face, but also by what he calls the bottomlessly cruel structures of power that limit the freedom and opportunity of those folks. And, Bald and then Buckley says, well, do the landlords tippy-toe uptown and throw garbage in the streets? And but for Baldwin, that was about as low as you could go. And Baldwin says, when he's asked about that encounter with Buckley later, he says, you know, I was trying to do what Martin was doing. 
I was trying to engage. I was trying to, you know, have a conversation with somebody, but Buckley won't listen. He's a bully. What I should have done is hit him over the head with my coffee cup. <laughs> now, Baldwin, of course, was making a joke, but it was a joke that had a very serious point at its core. At Cambridge, he says, toward the end of his speech, Baldwin says, what concerns me most is that we are, we are so unwilling to listen to each other that the very authority of discourse, the very authority of reason will break down. And where reason ends, war begins. Baldwin says, that's what concerns me most. And he says, I'm not just worried, he says this kind of implicitly, I'm not just worried that folks at the margins of society won't be willing to listen to somebody like Buckley, or even somebody like Robert Kennedy. Baldwin says, I'm worried folks at the margins aren't going to be willing to listen to me or to Martin. The society itself, the fabric of the society, is in danger of coming apart. Think about where we are now. Right? So Buckley, for his part, says, I never lost a debate by a larger margin than the one I lost to Baldwin. But there's no debate for which I have more pride. So he says, that, you know, his interviewer says, well, tell me more. And Buckley says, I didn't give them one goddamn inch. And that really captures right, Baldwin's concern about the authority of discourse breaking down because we can't hear each other. And Buckley's pride in his intransigence, it really captures you know, the, the tragedy of this story in so many ways. Now, I, I promised I'd leave with something, you know, that's a very slow moment to end on. So I, I will give you a, a hint of Baldwin's prescription uh, for, for what ails us. And the prescription for Baldwin is, is love. Now, Baldwin had a more complicated understanding of love than most. I, I, I've been telling people that the, to be loved by James Baldwin might not be a pleasant thing. <laughs> because James Baldwin says that love is not sentimental. It's not warm and cuddly. We have to move beyond what he calls an infantile understanding of love. Love is not about being happy. He said love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is about growing up. Baldwin says, in order to love yourself, you have to be willing to engage in a kind of ruthless introspection that really forces you to come to terms with who you take yourself to be and in what ways are you deluding yourself. And Baldwin says, to love another human being is to be willing to confront that other human being about the delusions under which they live. Baldwin says, the lover at his best does what lovers do, and that is reveal the beloved to himself, and with that, make freedom real. Thank you very much for your time. So the, the question for those, if anyone couldn't hear it, is, is who, who can we look to today as sort of a Baldwinian-like figure? I mean, there's a lot of, there's one answer I would give is, is this, is that um, is, there's just no one. Uh, to me, for me, uh, Baldwin um, is, there, there's just no one quite like Baldwin, in my opinion. Um, and Baldwin had this remarkable, remarkable, uh, ability, I think, to cut through to the heart of things. But I, I, I will say this, rather than, you know, sort of naming names of, of writers out there who I think are, are doing this, this sort of work, because there are, I think, a lot of folks who are, Baldwin, I think, in, in part, would, would answer that question if he were here by saying, that's not what we need to ask, right? Well, he, he wants all of us. Like, so he, Baldwin has all these wonderful speeches and essays about the role of the artist, right? So that line I ended with is about the artist you know, being in this role of being at war with his society, and that, that's a lover's war, is what Baldwin calls it. But he's not, Baldwin's not reflecting on those issues, you know, he's reflecting on them for some personal existential reasons, but he's really calling on all of us to tap into our inner artist, right? He's calling on all of us to tell truth uh, no matter what the consequences. Baldwin says that is, that is the thing, that, that is the struggle each and every moment of each and every day, is to constantly engage in this struggle both internally and with the world around us, to try to free ourselves from the delusions that lead us to treat one another inhumanely. That's what Baldwin said it was all about. If you can do that every day, you're going to make the world a better place. So I think that it's important, and you will find, right, and to, to just respond to the question more directly, um, you will find truth in all sorts of places, right? So there's a lot of great you know, writers, you know, but Baldwin himself, the most important ins inspiration for Baldwin was uh, Buford Delaney, a painter. 
So Baldwin says, you know, he, he, he gets to know Delaney when he's very young, he's a teenager. And he really sees, he says, Delaney says, there's no greater witness. No, no greater witness, no greater lover has ever held a brush, is what he says about Delaney. He says, Delaney is always seen, and he's always, he's, he's just always devoted to, to with his, his painting, helping us understand ourselves. And Baldwin sort of really sets out as his goal to try to do with his pen and typewriter what Delaney did with his brush. So, and that is, you know, we're, we, we can't all be great artists, right? But we can, we can all try to tap into the spirit of that, and I think that's what, what really matters to Baldwin. Uh, I had another question, but uh, you brought up some Baldwin right at the end. Uh, and I wonder if you could bring that reflection to 2020. The authority of reason will break down. We're not listening to each other. Yes. Uh, yeah, and this is, this is one of those things. Um, you know, as I, as I worked on this project, you know, I wish I could say I had this, you know, grand plan from the beginning of how this would all unfold in, in terms of the, this, you know, telling this, you know, this, this story, this history. Um, but uh, these issues, right, that, that are at the core of this, this battle between Baldwin and Buckley, of course, they're always urgent. And they're especially urgent for those at the margin, right? I think that a lot of us, you know, depending on our, you know, our privilege, are often able to not think about these, these issues as urgently as we are right now. And so I think there's a way in which, you know, as I was writing, I really sat down to, to write after doing a lot of research and thinking about the debate for several, several years. I really sat down to write in January 2016. And every day, uh, of course, this felt more and more urgent. Um, I think that, you know, one thing about, I'll just say in terms of the relevance, I mean, one thing about Baldwin that I think is really fascinating in terms of thinking about him, I, my training, by the way, my background is in political theory, right? So this is a different sort of book uh, for, for uh, political theorists to write. Um, but I think that one thing that Baldwin really teaches us about politics is that he was always somebody who was skeptical of either a fixation on either political heroes or political demons. Right, Baldwin said we, we have this tendency, right, in politics to find that person, that person that we really like, and, and sort of think if, if only that person can get elected, then we can turn this thing around. And we have that, of course, tendency to say that there's some people out there that we really don't like, and if only we can defeat that person, then things can turn around. But Baldwin says that's the wrong way to think about it. These people, right, these people are manifestations of us. Right, so Baldwin is always there to say, what can the rise of this movement or that movement or that politician, what, can that, what does that tell us about ourselves? And so that's not to say we need to disengage from politics, electoral politics, and so on and so forth. Baldwin said we need to be engaged, absolutely. And we need to celebrate moments of triumph. Baldwin is always there in those moments of triumph in his own life, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. He's always there to say, yes, but. Yes, this is extraordinarily important, we just did that. But I need you to tell me how the Voting Rights Act is really going to change the life of a teenager at the margins of our society. We have so much more work to do. So the idea of what political responsibility means to James Baldwin is about as radical as you can imagine. Showing up and voting, giving money to candidates, and so on and so forth, that stuff's important, but it's not sufficient. Baldwin would often, when people would ask him, who are you going to vote for? He'd say, John Brown. <laughs> Which was again another joke, but uh, but Baldwin said, you know, we need to stop getting so fixated on the on the what's happening at the top, and really think about our political lives in a radically democratic way. Uh, so I, that was I just I don't know how I got there from where you what you asked, but hopefully it was helpful. Uh, yeah, what, what other uh, questions are there? I have one over here. Um, it's perhaps more of a uh, question related to your personal journey. Um, I would ask you to talk about that moment um, when uh, Mr. Baldwin became that important uh, to you. That what it, it was a conjunction in your life, and what was it about Mr. Baldwin that drew you in the way that he has to this moment, and then from there to here? Oh man, true, true confessions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would say that it's a, it's a long story, and I don't want to, 
you know, after afterwards when we're having a beer at the bar, we can, we can get into more detail about this. But I, I think that, you know, what I would say um, for, for the purposes of, of this moment um, is that, you know, Baldwin was somebody who, when I first began to grapple with him in a serious way, uh, I found him to be immensely challenging. I was somebody, you know, I worked a lot with Frederick Douglass, and, and Douglass's political journey is, in some way, it's very complicated in its own way, but it, it was, uh, it was more directly, like there were certain political objectives that Douglass was trying to achieve in his life, and, and what I was trying to do is sort of trace that out and, and how he thought through these big political questions. As I confronted Baldwin, I, I had to, you know, confront somebody who was not going to give me a very clear, you know, a clear political program, uh, a, a very clear set of political objectives and how to achieve those objectives, but rather, you know, really a, a journey inward, right, and, and sort of forcing me to reflect on a lot of ways in which my own identity. Uh, was was deluded, right? And, and again, I don't I don't claim to have been liberated from that. I, Baldwin would say, "There's no that we don't wake up one fine day and, and we're free, right? It's a, it's a struggle that goes on every single day and every single moment." Um, and so I think as I as I began to to grapple with Baldwin in that way, um, I, I felt like although I knew I had it would be a challenging task for me to grapple with somebody who was operating at a different level than what I was used to and, and operating and also doing it in fiction, which is something I hadn't written much about, um, it was, I knew that there was something here that I needed um, in terms of sorting out, you know, my own life. And so uh, I think that, that was really crucial, and I think Baldwin, one thing that really drew me to him is, and this is something uh, I discovered in the, the archives at Harlem that I thought was really remarkable about him, is that he had this, there was an author questionnaire he filled out in the 1950s, you know, sort of helping this, his publisher sell his books and getting to know him a little bit better when he's sort of getting on the rise. And one of the questions in the questionnaire was, what sorts of people annoy you most? <laughs> and Baldwin says, uh, the doctrinaire, those who are never troubled by doubt. Um, and so I just love this idea. Baldwin has this kind of conception of life. He says, drive to the heart of every answer to expose the question that it hides. Right? And so there's something about that that can be a little frustrating politically because you're always doubting yourself. But there's something about that that is, is one of my colleagues who's written about Baldwin says, he's sort of Socrates in a different key. Right? He's just really this philosopher, poet, uh, artist. And so, um, I, yeah, that's a little bit about what's drawn me to him. And I, I still feel like I need to keep, I just don't want to leave James Baldwin as I'm looking around you know, and, and reading stuff for the next book project. Um, I, I feel, I realize how spoiled I, I've been, uh, but Baldwin will be a part of my life, you know, one way or another uh, going forward, for sure. Other questions? Hi. Sorry, I hate public speaking, so apologies if this comes out choppy. Um, so you mentioned a couple words that caught my attention, individualism and, uh, I believe, introspection. Um, and kind of looking around at the audience, demographically speaking, particularly at this topic, um, as a black queer person, these histories and having a space to hold them um, are very important and you can you know, see from the subject matter how just looking back at history we can see some truths about ourselves that we might prefer to ignore. So I ask you that, um, particularly in a region like the Pacific Northwest, what do you pose um, as, uh, to white people, what can they do to um, raise their level of social consciousness when it comes to racism? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. He didn't seem nervous at all, that was great. Um, yeah, I, and so I, because anything I have to say will be far far less profound than, than Baldwin, I'll, I'll lean on Baldwin here. Um, Baldwin, you know, he's, he's often in his, uh, his writing and his speaking, you know, he really, if you want, there's a few things you could say to really upset James Baldwin. One of them is to refer to the quote-unquote Negro problem, which of course everyone was doing in that era, including the liberals. And Baldwin said, it's not a Negro problem, it's a white problem. <laughs> right? It's, it, and you know, take this, this idea from Malcolm X, who, these people who imagine themselves to be white, um, that, that's this, you know, the, one of the sort of basic manif manifestations of this human trouble that he thought was, was haunting all of us. Um, and one thing I would say is that you know, Baldwin throughout his uh, his career, he tried to, you know, to reframe the discussion in that way, um, and really called on on white people to, to answer the question directly. 
to just respect a few words, right? We are human beings, just like you. Baldwin said, people who have, you know, who have mastered the Bible and you know, Friedrich Nietzsche, and he lists all these you know, sort of great books, they still haven't come to terms with that idea. And Baldwin says one thing that really, I mean, Baldwin could be absolutely brutal with liberals, more so than with people like Buckley in some ways. And Baldwin said the problem with liberals, and the Kennedy brothers were often the, the target of this criticism, the problem with a lot of white liberals is that they treat people like me, Baldwin said, as if I am a symbol, as if I am a statistic. In moments of celebration, they'll say, look at what we're doing here. Look at the positive steps that we're making. And Baldwin says he often felt this sense of that they were patronizing, right? They weren't really seeing the humanity in the other. And Baldwin says in the Cambridge speech, one of the most powerful moments in the aftermath of talking about Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy he says, Robert Kennedy said, 40 years from now, there might be a black president. 1965, right? A lot of people. And so Baldwin says, a lot of white people think that's a very emancipated statement. He says, they weren't in Harlem barbershops when that statement was heard. For the folks in the Harlem barbershops, they're saying, we've been here 400 years, and you just got here. And you're saying to us, maybe one day in 40 years, if you're good, you can be president too. And Baldwin says emphatically, I am not a ward of America. I'm not an object of missionary charity. I am one of the people who built the country. So until we come to terms with that history, Baldwin says, history is present in everything we do. Until we come to terms with that history. So he says, I call on white people to come to terms with history. That is what, that is the call that Baldwin makes. Until we come to terms with our history, we cannot treat each other as human beings. Now that's a complicated journey. And it's one that terrifies us. But that's what Baldwin calls on us to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is fascinating, all of it. Um, one of the things that I have been wondering about the whole time, and you mentioned this a little earlier, you said we could talk about this if we have some time. I'm hoping we have a little bit of time. Um, I was thinking about, you know, so this all comes to a head with their, um, their debate at Cambridge. But really, were they were they not kind of getting each other under each other's skin before that time? And I was fascinated by thinking about your reading in those archives and reading their letters, maybe finding some evidence of them, you know, getting each other's blood to boil. And what I mean, what really led up to it? Yeah. So th there's no question that um, Baldwin was on Buckley's mind prior to the, the debate, you know, and, and after the debate. Uh, Buckley wrote quite a bit about the debate. Um, and so, yeah, there's no question about it. They, Baldwin, on the other hand, um, didn't really devote much attention explicitly to Buckley, but of course a lot of the problems that he was thinking about were, were relevant for, for folks like Buckley and those, those who were following him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say that, that there is, what I try to do in the, in the book is you really leading up to this moment of, of clash. Um, there are ways in which implicitly and explicitly they're, they're getting ready, you know, to have this battle. Um, and I think that one thing that's really remarkable in the aftermath of the debate um, is that Buckley, you know, he ends up running for mayor of New York City in, you know, in uh, spring of 1965. So just after, this, it's like literally days after the second meeting with Baldwin on Open End. And he had, in that period between the Cambridge debate and that, uh, his, his announcing his candidacy for mayor of New York City, he had written quite a bit about Baldwin and essentially said that Baldwin did not triumph that night because his arguments were any better. Uh, he triumphed that night because the audience, those young uh, Cambridge students, just wanted to affirm his identity. Oh. And. Um, and so Buckley makes Baldwin part of his stump speech. When he announces his candidacy for mayor of New York City, Baldwin is part of his speech. Uh, when he's giving any speech on, he has a thoroughly, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, agenda, you know, races it kind of at every, every turn in his, his agenda, um, Baldwin is there. He brings Baldwin up as a symbol of all the things that are wrong. Um, and so there's, there's a way in which Buckley kind of had Baldwin on his mind. The most remarkable moment for me and this is something I have to sort of take a leap in the book to, to make this case. But right after Baldwin 
uh, has that second encounter with Buckley. The next week, he's invited by Ebony Magazine to write an essay on the white problem. And he writes an essay called The White Man's Guilt. And there is just, you know, he does not mention Buckley by name, but it just seems, because of the timing and what he says in the essay, he is talking about Buckley. Um, and so there's, there's a, I really recommend that essay to everybody. It's published a few months later. Actually, it's on newsstands when the Watts riot happens in 1965. Um, but yeah, so there, there's all sorts of ways in which they're on each other's minds. Buckley is writing about Baldwin as early as like 1961, and he's calling him an eloquent menace and things like that, basically saying Baldwin is this very dangerous character. So when the, Buckley agreed with J. Edgar Hoover that Baldwin was an individual likely to commit acts inimical to national security. This will be our last question. You said your final vote was 500 something to 100 something, all on one. So in a debate like that, how are you supposed to vote? Are these votes reflecting reflect 500 some some 500 some people mm -hmm. they agree with Baldwin's views versus 100 some they, they agree with William Buckley's votes views or who is a better debater? Mm -hmm. How are you supposed to vote? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's. Uh, it's, it's sort of a combination of both. I mean, that they're, they're, they're in part, I mean, you sort of go, I mean, you go into those debates sort of thinking about the motion at the start. Where do I come down on this motion as we start the debate? And then kind of who moves me more in their, in their direction? Um, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, they frame the, the motions like they, they would frame, a, you know, a motion in the House of Commons and they have, uh, they have, they, they do the vote based on that. And, and that debate is interesting. I mean, there are, I just received a, um, an email yesterday from somebody who would like to review the book, and he, he said, I, you know, when I was at Columbia in 1965, I was the only student in the class who said Buckley won. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure he'll write a great review. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'm happy, to, I'm gonna, I, I have a red eye tonight to go talk in Tennessee tomorrow, but I'm, I'm gonna hang out until then, and I'm happy to sign books over here. Please uh, support independent bookstores, and I'm really grateful to all of you.